Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I see we have a standing room only at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm a New Yorker, so I'm always impressed when people are at any meeting before about 9.30, but this is very impressive. Um, my name is Bruce Jones. I'm the Vice President and the Director of Foreign Policy here at Brookings, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you today, and in particular to welcome our very distinguished guests. We're very honored to have to be joined today by Senator John McCain and Congressman Mark Mac Thornby, uh, Chairman of the Senate and House Armed Services Committee, respectively, to discuss the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, a $612 billion Pentagon appropriation bill for 2016, which I think is vital to the national conversation. Uh, moderating our discussion will be our very own Michael O'Hanlon, co-director of the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence here at Brookings, and a very well-known expert on the defense budget. Uh, Senator McCain is extremely well known for his service to the nation, both in the U.S. Navy and in representing the people of Arizona in the U.S. Congress. He's been one of the key voices in the fight to strengthen American national security and our armed forces, to eliminate wasteful government spending, and to reform government. Congressman Thornberry has served in the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, as well as on the Budget Committee, the Resources Committee, and the Select Committee on, on Homeland Security, and is widely known as an innovator and a strategic thinker in, in national security, and the two of them have been working together to put together the National Defense Authorization Act. In a moment, I'll turn to Mike to, to frame and lead the discussion, but let me just make two brief points of context. It seems to me that we are clearly entering a moment of intensifying geopolitical challenge in both Asia and Europe, as well as confronting the rolling collapse of the post-Ottoman order in the Middle East with the huge implications for our interests and our values. And the second is despite uh, many Jeremiah's to the opposite and the premature reports of our decline, the United States remains the most important actor on the world stage and the most important potential contributor to stability in Asia, in Europe, and the Middle East. It seems to me that's the context in which we have to have the debate and the discussion about our Defense Appropriations Act and the tools we need uh, for American national security. Mike, with that, over to you, and thank, thank you all you. for joining us. Thank you, Bruce, and Chairman Thornberry, Chairman McCain. A great honor for us to have you both here. Uh, I think all of you know where we stand, and let me just say a couple of words before turning to our distinguished guests, uh, where we stand in the defense debate. Uh, but just to remind, uh, today, I believe, the Congress will send the President the National Defense Authorization Act that these two gentlemen and their colleagues of both parties and both houses of Congress have been working on all year. Uh, that would, in addition to funding the Pentagon at the $612 billion level, which is the level the President had requested, by the way, last winter, also take some important steps forward on acquisition reform, on authorizing various steps in regard to Syria, Ukraine, other places, deal with the military pension question, where so far in our modern history, the military has given a generous pension to those who did 20 years service, but nothing to those who do 19 or less. And therefore, there's some changes in the bill that would address that. Many other important bipartisan achievements. But of course, we're at a juncture where high budget politics, if you will, are interfering with the likely prospects of this bill. And the president has threatened to veto it. And he'll now have 10 days uh, accepting Sundays, as I just learned from the chairman uh, for how this is counted, uh, to make his decision about whether to veto or not. And if he does, we will uh, lose all the, potentially lose, all of the reforms in addition to the $612 billion authorization. Uh, the senator and the congressman have both pointed out the president could, in theory, uh, support this bill and then potentially veto an appropriations bill, if he wished, <laughs> later on, because as you're aware, uh, what's going on right now is the Congress has tried to find a way to fully fund defense, but the Budget Control Act continues to <coughs> prevent the funding levels the President would advocate for non-defense. So we're at this juncture, how do you reconcile these competing concerns? And we'll get to that big high-level question whenever the Chairman wish, and certainly by the, the second half hour of this conversation. But I thought we'd begin by talking about some of the specifics that are in the bill that are so important. And I think regardless of one's position on whether the president should veto or not, most would agree that the reforms and the initiatives in this legislation are very, very helpful to our national defense. And it would be wonderful to find a way to institute them in law. And so that's really the subject with which I wanted to begin. And so, Senator McCain, if I could begin by asking you uh, to 
address the military pension reforms and anything else you wish to touch on in the personnel domain, and then we'll work through acquisition and some of the overseas crisis and hotspots in a minute as well before getting to the big picture questions. But uh, thank you for being here, and if I could ask you about military pension reform. Well, thank you, Mike. And um, as I always say when I return here, and I'm always happy to, it's nice to see old friends and enemies back here at Brookings. <laughs> Uh, thank you for inviting me back, and could I also say that uh, it's been a, a, a real honor for me to have worked with Chairman Thornbury, uh, a very dedicated and hardworking chairman who also is committed uh, to many of the reforms that we were able to enact together, particularly the issue of acquisition reform. There are many reforms, but acquisition reform has been and Mac has been engaged in that for uh, many years. And that does not mean that we agree on everything always. <laughs> in fact, we've had very spirited discussions on occasion, but uh, I, we really am proud of the product that we and the members of our committees, overwhelmingly bipartisan, have approved of. Uh, the vote in our committee was like 14 to 4 and similar in, in the House. So it's not. It's the, the, our product is a bipartisan product. If there was re objection to it, it was by members who um, were concerned or um, objected to this OCO process, which maybe we can talk about a, a little later on. But the product was overwhelmingly bipartisan, which is maybe unusual in Congress these days, but. <coughs> But I think it shows the commitment of members on both sides of the aisle to the men and women who are serving and, uh, and a bipartisan approach to defense. My friends, today, 85% of the men and women who serve in the military when they leave the military don't have any financial benefit. They certainly have veterans benefits and <coughs> GI Bill and other benefits, but as far as pure financial is concerned, 85% <clears throat> because those 85% don't serve 20 years. So <clears throat> with the benefit of a very a excellent commission that was composed of some pretty outstanding people, we adopted largely uh, the, their recommendation, which now allows someone to, after two years and one month, to uh, contribute as in a 401k to, and the matching funds are required. But this way, some 85% of those who serve will receive a financial benefit from their service, even if it's only a minimum of, of two years. And if I could just expand one second on that, we, there are other reforms that are gonna have to be made in the entitlements uh, in the military. Uh, Bob, uh, Secretary Gates uh, a few years ago said we were going to be eaten alive by the personnel costs which continue to rise, a lot of it understandable in an all-volunteer military, but we're going to have to make some very tough decisions on that aspect, the entitlement aspect of the military over time, and it's not going to be easy. You sort of found a way to straddle that if, uh, or compromise on that in a sense, I believe, with the military pay increase, right, which is modest, but it's at least there. So that's sort of a step in that direction, and also some of the TRICARE issues. That's Exactly. Yeah. Mac, do you want so, Congressman, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for being here as well. And if you wanted to comment on any of these personnel reforms, but also maybe launch into the discussion on acquisition reform that I know you and Senator McCain have done so much to work on. Sure. Well, uh, again, thank you for having us. Uh, and, and I very much enjoyed and appreciated the opportunity to work with Chairman McCain, who occupies truly a unique place in American history and, and political life today. The loser. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Um, and, 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 and just in a preliminary way, I want to emphasize uh, what he just said, and that is when you look at the merits of the bill, it truly is a bipartisan product. Our bill came out of committee 60 to 2, and there was one of each who were a part of the two. Uh, so from the very conception, it has been Republicans and Democrats working together in committee, on the floor, in conference, that has produced this product. It is only this overlay of what I believe is essentially politics that is even causing us to be here to, to have in any sort of, of controversy. 
Uh, and I think we have, because a defense authorization bill has been signed into law every year for 53 straight years, we may take for granted all the individual provisions. I mean, Chairman McCain was just talking about the, the retirement reform. Let me, let me just mention one other little provision in the personnel section, and, and that is a requirement that DOD and the VA have the same formulary when treating people for PTS, sleep disorder, and pain management. General Corelli has testified, if you could just do one thing to help PTS victims, make sure that the drug they get on when they're in the military, they can stay on when they move to the VA system. And they haven't been able to do that. The systems have not been able to do that. We require them to do that in this bill. And so if the bill goes down, that requirement does not get enacted. And, and, and my point is there are 600-something provisions in this bill uh, that do important things that the system is not able to do on its own. Uh, and, and so that's, that's part of the reason we have a separate branch of government to pass a defense authorization bill. Among the reforms, as, as Chairman McCain mentioned, is, is, uh, is a beginning of acquisition reform. And, and my shorthand version of it is, if it continues to take us 20 years to field a new airplane, that airplane is going to be hopelessly out of date by the time it gets there. We've got to do better. We've got to do better at being more agile in fielding technology quicker, in responding to threats, and, by the way, getting more value for the taxpayer dollars. And, and so we have a number of reforms, kind of fundamental reforms, thinning out some of the regulations, requiring more of the work be done up front, not invent as you go in acquisition. But it's only a beginning, and, and, and we, we are committed on a bipartisan basis to doing much more work in, in the future. But, as I say, even that first step doesn't happen if the bill doesn't become law. Could I just... Please. Yeah. You know, there are seminal moments in people's <coughs> experiences, and I mentioned this to you earlier, Mike. It was uh, two years ago we had a hearing on the, uh, with the Navy witness, uh, with the Chief of Naval Operations, and I asked who, if, if the Chief of Naval Operations knew who was responsible for the $2.4 billion cost overrun on the USS Gerald R. Ford, one of our latest aircraft carriers. I said, well, who's responsible for this $2.4 billion cost overrun? And he said, I don't know. And my friends, we now have a Pentagon that a multi-billion dollar cost overrun, and nobody knows who is responsible. One of the major features of our legislation to start with, as Max pointed out, is that the service chiefs have to sign off when, they, when there's a cost overrun called Nun McCurdy, then they have to sign off on that, and they are responsible. And guess what? The service chiefs want that responsibility. They crave that responsibility because they want a better Army, Navy, and Air Force, and Marine Corps as well. So um, it, as, as Mac mentioned, we're just beginning because we have a long, long way to go. Finally, could I just mention, both Mac and I have been out to, to, to Silicon Valley, and <coughs> I'm sorry to tell you that right now there's not a lot of interest in Silicon Valley in being engaged in acquisition um, with the military and with the Pentagon because they don't see any benefit in getting involved in the labyrinth that is called defense acquisition. And that has got to be another one of our priorities and that's where we're making the first step to make it so that we can engage Silicon Valley, because we all know the nature of warfare. When, the, when we read in the paper this morning that the director of the CIA has had his server hacked, um, my friends, we are we're in an interesting high-tech cyber situation. If I could follow up on acquisition policy, with apologies to some of you who I know are here more to talk about vetoes and top-level budget issues, and we'll get to that, uh, but I these these gentlemen have been working on acquisition policy and defense for so long and with such commitment that I think it's worth bearing down for a moment or two on that question. If I could just ask you to talk both about where we stand in the history of defense acquisition reform, because if we go back to the days, Senator McCain, for example, when you were a Navy pilot, at that point the services did run the acquisition world, 
and it was before Goldwater Nichols and the centralization was, of certain uh, authorities. That was, that was during the Coolidge administration, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and of course, we thought that at that juncture, maybe we were wrong at the time, but we, we ultimately concluded at that juncture we had given them too much leeway to make their own decisions. They weren't doing enough things that were joint. Uh, they weren't they were perhaps putting too much high technology or silver plating into weapons because there were the cultures of you know the, the fighter jock and the carrier uh, and so forth that that really put a premium on high performance and cost wasn't sufficiently considered or uh, or timeliness in some of the acquisition programs. So we tried to centralize. Goldwater Nichols reforms of the 80s tried to do that. Uh, and and here we are today. Are, are you essentially saying we've overdone it? and we need to go a little bit back to the old days, or are, is the current model that you're proposing in this legislation uh, essentially a new approach that gives the services more authority, but in a different way than in the old days? It was about 30 years ago that Goldwater Nichols was enacted, and the one thing we are committed to is a thorough and complete review of Goldwater Nichols. Overall, Goldwater Nichols was a great success, we will all admit. But times have changed over the last 30 years. The, the challenges have changed. A lot of things have changed. And so we're committed to starting, frankly, as soon as we get through this hurdle, starting hearings to review uh, Goldwater Nichols to, so that we can uh, make the changes that are necessary. Um, it's not as difficult as one at first thinks. And let me just give you one example. When we saw that the IEDs, many of them imported from Iran, many of them sent by uh, Mr. Soleimani, who is now seems to be, according to the Washington Post, in charge of conflicts in at least three countries, um, sent in these copper-tipped IEDs. And these copper-tipped IEDs went right through light armor. The Humvees were getting taken out, and our casualties were really high. So we went through, because the MRAP was in being, we went through a rapid acquisition process, got those MRAPs over to <coughs> Iraq, and it, I don't know how many lives that it saved. We used an accelerated process. If we'd have taken the 20-year route that Mac just referred to of the F-35, God knows what would have happened. So there is a model out there, at least in some areas, already in being that, that we could look at uh, now, that, is, uh, that, that MRAP was already a developed uh, technology. It wasn't something brand new, but at least we were able to get it to the battlefield in a matter of weeks or months, I'm not, I'm not uh, but in a very rapid uh, process, and I don't know how many lives that it saved because we, this, the, M, the uh, IEDs couldn't penetrate the MRAP. That's an example of what we can do if we get the right process into the Pentagon. Sure. And, and I'd just say, uh, I don't think anybody who says, turn back the clock, and that was perfect by any stretch. But it is true that pendulum swing, and we have swung in a direction where there are more layers of bureaucracy, which, as Chairman McCain indicates, results in no accountability for the decisions, because everybody does this. Uh, and, and plus, it is, it is incredibly slow. So that's part of our just overall theme is simplify so that somebody makes a decision and you can hold them accountable for the decision. Um, and, and also to, to speed up the, the innovation so that um, we can get capability so that, every, so that the MRAP is not the exception, so, so that that is more the, the norm. And I would say there's a fundamental change and that is the number of complex national security threats that we face all at the same time, Dr. Kissinger testified in front of Chairman McCain about this, is, is unique in history. And we have to respond in a more agile way. You cannot respond with this layered bureaucracy that has, has developed. Now, I will, I'll also admit, we're part of the problem. So part of what happens is there's a cost overrun in the past, and what do we do? We set a new bureaucracy or a new procedure to make sure that never happens again. Well, we can't do that 
Um, and, and we can talk more about that if you want to. It goes back to the simplify and accountability is, is the direction to go, not all these uh, checks and balances that paralyze the system. And, um, so, and, and so I think that's the direction we are, are trying to go. Just the other point to emphasize, um, too many programs we're inventing as we're buying. Uh, and that is a source of a lot of the cost overruns and the delays. Uh, one of the things that uh, we want to move more toward is, is have your technology development over here, but then you buy established technology so you're not inventing on the fly. And, and I think we end up with, with better results. So I've got two more questions before we'll turn to you. And one of them, speaking of global hotspots, is going to be about some of the things in, in your bill that would allow the president some new authorities to do different things in Syria, Ukraine, and other parts of the world. And then secondly, I do want to ask about the hypothetical, were the president to veto this bill, can we imagine a path forward? Can you propose a possible uh, you know, roadmap, recognizing that a lot of other people will have a say in that as well, and we're getting ahead of ourselves even to speculate, but seems like it's a fairly imminent debate. Uh, but back to the, to the bill itself and to the um, hotspots. Again, you've got important language on Syria, Ukraine, other areas, Iraq. I wondered if either one of you wanted to begin and then maybe the other follow up on those questions. Well, um, we try to give the president more tools to deal with a complex world. For example, we have authority to provide defensive lethal assistance to Ukraine. Uh, and there is a huge amount of bipartisan consensus in the House and the Senate that that should be done. Um, in, in Iraq, we say that if the secretary cannot certify that the Iraqi government is inclusive, then, then they are authorized to give weapons directly to the Kurds, to the Sunni tribes, and other groups. Um, so that everything doesn't have to go through, through Baghdad. Now, we can't make the president take any specific, one of those specific options, but we're trying to give him more tools to deal with a rapidly evolving situation. And we are expressing the sense of Congress bipartisan on both of those issues. Um, we, I hope that we are, remain very careful that the Constitution says the President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief. And so for us to say that he has to give those weapons, that, in my view, is not in our area of responsibility. But we not only give them the authority, but overwhelmingly, that is the policy we want him to, uh, to pursue. I, my friends, I've been to Ukraine on many occasions, and uh, when these people are crying for a javelin because Russian tanks are there in eastern Ukraine, and we won't give them that, we won't give them intelligence, we, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking is what it is. I used to get angry, now I'm just heartbroken at so many people who have been killed. Uh, They're fighting bravely with 20th century weapons against 21st century weapons, which Vladimir Putin is, uh, is sending in. Um, and as far as the Kurds in Baghdad is concerned, uh, again, it's obviously a vacuum that's been created, but a new uh, intelligence uh, sharing now between Iraq, Russia, Syria, and Iran. That's an interesting scenario, one that, frankly, I never would have anticipated a fairly short time ago. And now there's talk about, and I hope it's only talk, about Russian air power being brought into Iraq to, uh, against ISIS. It might be nice to see him doing something against ISIS from one standpoint instead of the moderate opposition, which is the object of almost all of their attacks. But um, we, 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 I think that's one thing is clear. The people who are really the best fighters right now for a whole variety of reasons are the Kurds. They're the ones that, that, that liberated Kobani. They're the ones that are are doing a lot of the work in parts of Syria. And as you pointed out, Mike, um, this is a very dangerous game because there's the Turkish aspect, there's the KKK, none of it is simple. But at least in the short term, I think it's pretty clear that if we gave the Kurds uh, the weapons that they probably need, they could be much more effective in achieving some of at least our short-term goals that we are not achieving right now. 
So thank you. And let me ask my final question, which has to do with the big picture. And again, to remind those of you, I think everybody in this room is following this to some extent. But the basic idea here is the president has said he's happy with a higher level of defense spending, but he objects to the use of the overseas contingency operations account to do it. It's essentially a safety valve that the Defense Department has available to it that domestic accounts from science to education to infrastructure don't have available. And he wants to demand some kind of a bill, like a, the Ryan Murray compromise of two years ago, that would increase funding on both the defense and non-defense sides. The Congress has basically said, uh, we're not going to do that, but we do have a safety valve in the defense realm. And isn't that better than nothing to at least address defense needs and save the domestic debate for a different day and maybe next year's campaign? Perhaps I'm oversimplifying, but that's how I sort of see the debate boiling down. Which leads to my question, and obviously you could either say whatever you want and challenge my, my rendition of where we stand, but, but in terms of if there is a veto, wouldn't a natural compromise essentially be for the domestic accounts to get maybe half as much of a plus up as defense? In other words, a Ryan Murray bill, but tilted more in favor of defense, because that would essentially be a compromise between where the president is and where the congressional leadership is. So one imagines preserving the funding levels that you've got in your bill, but maybe increasing the domestic accounts roughly half as much for this year and next year. Uh, if you don't like that proposal, obviously I'd love to hear anything else that, that you think may be a viable way forward so we can someday get a defense bill, even if the president vetoes this in the short term. Uh, Chairman McCain, would you like to start? Or? First of all, we authorized to the level that the president requested. I think that's an important fundamental fact. He asked for 681, I believe it was, like, whatever, like at exact well, level yeah. the president requested. <clears throat> Second of all, it's an authorizing bill. It is not a money bill. The money is in the Appropriations Committee. So if he has a problem with the level of appropriations, then it seems to me that fight should be with the appropriators and that aspect of funding. We authorize, and we've just been through a small number. This is a big bill. Of all the reforms, all the benefits and pay and all of the things that we're doing, the reforms, and so it seems to me he's picked the wrong target. Second of all, and second or third of all, he has accepted other bills with OCO in it. It is not as if this is a brand new problem. And OCO, we don't like OCO. We don't like it. Mac and I really dislike it because we'd like to see a multi-year uh, level of authorization that we can plan on rather than lurching from one year to the next to see whether the budget committee is going to approve uh, OCO or not. I don't like it. But, and we'd rather in a perfect world see that level of, of, of budgeting that we can plan on and that more importantly that the military can plan on. They're lurching from year to year, my friends. They don't, how can you, over in the Pentagon, how can you plan ahead on almost anything if you don't know what the following year's spending level is going to be? So it's a broken system. Uh, um, uh, if the president decides to veto this, then it seems to me that he is placing a higher priority over his concern and opposition to the funding budgetary mechanism than he is over the defense of the country. Because if he cared most about the defense of the nation, then he would focus his attention on the appropriations bills. F veto the appropriations bills then, Mr. President, because you don't like the way the money, where the money is coming from. So it, it, it really is, uh, uh, it's hard for me to understand why the President of the United States should focus on the defense of the nation. And finally, again, on sequestration, my friends, it is a disaster. It is a disaster in so many ways. Uh, in two th Look at the world in 2011 when we enacted it, be the Budget Control Act, and look at the world today. And yet we continue to cut defense spending. I wouldn't mind increases in some, in some spending, particularly where intelligence and other aspects are, are concerned, the CIA, uh, many other agencies of government. But this is really an unnecessary fight, and I really wish that the president would reserve that fight 
if he feels that strongly about the overseas con contingency operations to the appropriations uh, process. Chairman Thornberry. It, just to reiterate just a bit, the President submitted a budget request for defense that the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs said is the lower ragged edge of what is necessary to defend the country. He uh, did not follow the Budget Control Act, and he asked for more base than was allowed in the Budget Control Act, and he asked for $50 billion in OCO funding, $50 billion. When, when the House and Senate come up with a budget resolution, we have to follow the law, we believe, on the Budget Control Act, so we have a lower base, but we make up the difference in OCO, so it's an extra $38 billion in OCO, but the total is exactly the same. The only question is which category the funding is, is put in. All of that extra OCO, by the way, or, or, or I think essentially all of it, is operation and maintenance accounts, and every dollar of it is authorized just like the base is. So there's no difference between the being allocated to specific programs by being in OCO versus, versus being in base. In addition, Section 1501 of the NDAA says if there is a change in the sequestration numbers or the caps or anything, then uh, uh, that OCO is automatically adjusted to the base. So we have this automatic flexibility mechanism to, to reflect whatever budget agreement com comes up. But, but here to me is the bigger point. If you are a counterterrorism soldier in Afghanistan today, or if you are training the Iraqi army today, or if you are at a Navy, Air Force, or Marine, or Army base in the United States supporting those efforts, do you really care whether your operation and maintenance funds are classified as OCO or whether they're classified as base? Don't you just want the money? Don't you just want the support to know that it's there? And so in some ways, I think this is kind of an inside Washington political game that loses sight of what we are asking men and women to do for us all around the country. And, and, and in that way, I think it is tragic. I think it is, as the Washington Post has written, if he vetoes it, it'll be historic, but not in a good way. Because there is nothing we could do in this bill that would fix the problem he's complaining about. I mean, I'd be fine with your solution to put more money in some domestic programs. And I suspect at the end of the day, as, as John says, that there will be appropriations, uh, you know, something has to be worked out before December 11th. Um, so I'm, I'm for, for, for whatever can be done. But I'm not willing to put at risk all of the reforms that we were talking about. And, and just last point. Um, the world, as we've been talking, is growing more dangerous and more complex. I think if there's ever a time the world, not to mention our troops, need to see institutions of the American government operating for national defense, it's now. And so I don't pretend that, that signing a defense authorization bill solves all this other problem. We still have these other problems to deal with. But good heavens, it, wouldn't it be, with a, such strong bipartisan support of the bill, wouldn't it be a good thing for the country and the world to see that we can do something together instead of playing political games? But I also point out one additional factoid. In this bill, there's $11 billion in elimination of waste and excessive spending that is saved. For example, we require a 7.5% cut per year for four years in the size of staffs and headquarters. And so we are saving $11 billion in this legislation that is much needed. And frankly, we're skimming the, 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 the we're, we're taking out the easy targets uh, in, in this bill. And it's easy. And to, so we're now going to dispense with his veto of $11 billion in savings. Thank you. Let's go to you, please. Uh, Get my attention, wait for a microphone, identify yourself, and if you could just ask one question, and we'll try to make room for everyone who would like to get into this. We'll start over here, please. Good 
Good morning. My name is Erica McCann with the IT Alliance for Public Sector, and we just wanted to say on behalf of the tech industry, we really appreciate the commercial item and regulatory review provisions in this year's bill around acquisition reform. But you both emphasized the word beginning when talking about acquisition reform with this year's bill. Where do you see the FY17 bill going? Well, as, as I mentioned, I think one of the big challenges we face is inventing technology as we are purchasing it. So I, I think focusing on that issue is, is something for the future. We have a lot more um, thinning out of the regulations and simplification to do. As uh, John was talking about the challenge of Silicon Valley doing business with the Department of Defense, it's not just Silicon Valley. There's all sorts of key industries that are saying, I don't really think it's worth doing business with those people. They're so bureaucratic, it's so difficult. I have to have so many lawyers and regulators, accountants to deal with them. That is a huge problem because a key strength for us has always been the innovation that comes from the private sector that we plug into defense. So there is so much more to do, and we will never fix it, by the way, all the way. It is taking steps each year to make it better. I, I would only add that um, there is a perception in many areas of industry that there, that the Pentagon only does business with certain favored industry that they've done business with for years and years and years. Whether that is accurate or not, I can't say. But that's the perception when I talk to people who don't traditionally do business with the Pentagon. And I think that's, and the other aspect is we're going to have to look at the entitlements. We're going to have to look at TRICARE. We're going to have to look at a number of those aspects of defense spending and that, that uh, need reform. And don't think that's going to be easy. That may be one of our most difficult challenges. Incidentally, quick vignette, we had an event here in April with Undersecretary Kendall, who is in charge of DOD acquisition, and also with Bill Lynn, who of course had been Deputy Secretary. And I asked, first I asked Secretary Kendall the question, how would you rate our acquisition system? And he said, well, you know, we have a lot of problems, and I've been doing this better buying power stuff, but we also have the best equipment in the world, and I'm sure you two would agree with that. And so overall, I'd not say... Always, not always at a reasonable cost. Not always at a reasonable <laughs> cost or schedule. And, and he said, so overall, for all the work we still have to do, I'd give us a B plus. And then I asked Bill Lynn the same question, and Bill said, well, maybe a B plus for some of the things we've been traditionally good at, some of the larger platforms, but anything where Moore's Law is involved, I'd say more like a C minus. And it gets to this issue of whether we're at the beginning or the mid midpoint or closer to where we need to be. Uh, we'll stay here in the front row for a moment. Hello, good morning. Uh, this is Salman Ansari, and I'm from Saudi Arabia, Saudi writer and political commentator. I would like, first of all, to thank you all for this beautiful panel. I would like to thank uh, Senator McCain for his support for global security, which is right now we are seeing it to be at stake, specifically like there was a, an article that was written in Wall Street Journal just yesterday that talked about um, the fact that Obama is somehow taking the military hostage. And you've retweeted this just yesterday. I would like to say that the current administration of the United States is not taking the military hostage, but it's taking the global security hostage. Why? Because of the issues that we are facing in Ukraine, in Syria, in Iraq, in so many different areas around the world without crucial actions that are taken uh, into place. But at the same time, uh, Representative um, uh, Max said something beautiful, which is political games. And that's what we are seeing from this administration at the moment. So Please get to a question. what is your point of view regarding um, um, uh, the future of the United States when it comes to global security? Will they still follow the same path that President Obama has assigned, which is the military new doctrine? Well, I, I try to be <coughs> as brief as possible. Long term, I am incredibly optimistic about America and its role in the world, whether you're talking about technology, whether you're talking about the fact we're now uh, energy independent, whether you're talking about all of the, the new devices, the new ways of uh, conveying information and knowledge are invented in the United States, 
manufacturing capability has improved. In the long term, I am very bullish on America. In the short term, I agree with Henry Kissinger. The world has not seen more crises than we're in today since the end of World War II. Uh, we see, if there's any benefit, we now see an, an alliance or a relationship between Israel and some of the Sunni nations that we had never seen before. That's really digging for the pony, to tell you the truth. But <clears throat> I see an absence of American leadership. And I see, frankly, some of the countries in the region kind of hedging their bets and accommodating. Saudi Arabia just made a $9 billion arms deal with Russia. I don't believe that Russia can provide them with superior weapons. I think it's because that Saudi Arabia has been looking at the relationships. And I still think that a seminal moment was the day when Saudi Arabia had planes on the runway ready to strike Syria. And they found out on CNN that uh, crossing the red line was basically meaningless on chemical weapons. So I think in the short term, we are in the most serious challenge. And you didn't even mention the South China Sea, by the way. That's uh, another area. But f finally, we're seeing what Iran is seeking and Russia is helping them. And this is an arc of Shia influence in the region as, as we see the latest activities, uh, military activities in Syria and the continued slaughter of young men who we are training and equipping and sending into Syria. We're watching the Russians bomb and kill them while our, our major uh, priority is deconfliction. De That's a new word for appeasement. That we don't want to have any, inter we don't want to run into any Russian airplanes. Certainly we wouldn't want to run into any Russian airplanes while they're bombing the hell out of the people that we train and equip and send in into Syria. Don't think that that lesson is lost on other young people who we might ask to go in and fight against ISIS and against a brutal regime which has killed 240,000 of its own people and driven millions into refugee status. Care to comment? I, I just, the point was made in the introduction. The United States is a unique force for good in the world. Political dysfunction and political gamesmanship here has consequences far beyond our shores. It is even more the reason where if we can do something together, we ought to do that. Sydney, you're in the third row, please. Good morning. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, to get back to the agonizing political games for a moment, your favorite thing I know, uh, if there is a veto, is there some way to start disaggregating the NDA. That's never been done before in 53 years. We have never had to. But are there ways to split off pieces, to put placeholders in, to say, you know, we author for certain things so that you can preserve, uh, for example, the acquisition reforms, the compensation reforms, while just deferring perhaps parts of the bill uh, that authorize specific amounts uh, since and from specific sources, which uh, is what's the matter of contention. Well, I just, there is, the president's basic complaint is he wants to spend more money on domestic programs, EPA, IRS, whatever. We can't do that in a defense authorization bill. We can take it apart, we can put it together, we can put the pieces back a different way. We cannot fix his basic problem in any defense authorization bill because his basic problem is he wants to spend more money on other stuff. Now, I might agree on some of those other things that we ought to spend money on, but we can't fix it in this bill, which is why the Washington Post says vetoing it for not for anything that's in it, but because of this broader budget disagreement, using it as a hostage would be historic. We will stay here in the front row or the second row, and then we'll work our way back in just a moment. Yes, please. John Harper with National Defense Magazine. Uh, my question is for both of you. You've talked about the differences with the White House over OCO versus base budget funding, but are there any substantive uh, policy disagreements? And if so, would you be willing to uh, negotiate on any of those in order to preserve you know, acquisition reform if the White House was willing to 
approve uh, an authorization act and fight over the money later in uh, an appropriations bill. There's one major uh, issue that I know of, and that is, of course, uh, Guantanamo. And <clears throat> we have pretty strict provisions in the bill. And by the way, I would remind you that when the president released five uh, prisoners in exchange for Bergdahl, he broke the law, which no one seems to be too concerned about. But um, we, what we have asked for is a plan. We've asked for the president to submit to us. I've, I've been waiting six and a half years for a plan as to how they want to close Guantanamo and how they want to move those prisoners and where to. I don't think that's a lot to ask for us to authorize such a thing to get a plan. And as short a time ago as four months ago, the president assured me that he would send us a plan and his, Lisa Monaco and Ash Carter came over and sat in my office two months ago and said, three months ago and said, we'll give you a plan. So far, there is no plan. But that is an, an issue that is of continuing disagreement between the president and, and us. And just as a reminder, the, uh, the language that the president primarily complains about on Guantanamo is exactly the same language he signed into law in 2010, in 2011, in 2012, in 2013, and in 2014. So uh, he doesn't really like it, but until there's a plan that can get the support of the American people and their representatives, I suspect most members of Congress are going to say, don't uh, bring them here and don't modify facilities here, which is basically the, the, uh, the, the provisions. Of course, there are other differences between what the president asked for and what's in our bill. Um, the president uh, proposed to retire the A-10 aircraft. Well, it turns out they are sending A-10s into the Middle East today and relying on them. And our judgment was uh, probably it's not a good idea to retire that air. So there are, of course, there are differences of opinion. We don't know Congress rubber stamps a, a president's uh, request. But if you look at the Constitution, it says that Congress has the responsibility to build and provide and maintain armies, navies, and, and, and other military forces. So, of course, there are differences. But uh, our colleagues in Congress and the president really is focused on the OCO issue. Let's see here. In the very back, woman in the white coat against the door. Yes, please. Um, Victoria Panaccio with Green Cross International. Um, the 2016 NDAA conference report um, states that there's congressional intent to reject the budget request to authorize another BRAC round in 2017. And I was just wondering why is that, um, since it saves money and that in the long term there seems to be um, an improvement in recovery in most local communities? Um, <coughs> because the 2005 BRAC has not yet broken even. In other words, 10 years later, it has still cost the taxpayers more money than it has saved. Uh, so I think there are a lot of members who were here for 2005 and say, we're not going to have a repeat of that. Now, there is another provision in the bill that says the department has to come to Congress with more specific data about where you think you have excess infrastructure. Because what we've heard for the past several years is all based on a study they did in 2004, and, and we're saying, okay, let's not just trot out old information over and over again. If you think you have too much infrastructure, come give us more specifics about it, and we'll look at it, and there may well be another BRAC in the future. Uh, but for this year, and remember this is a one-year authorization bill, whether we're talking Gitmo or BRAC, uh, for this year there will not be another BRAC. And I, I just quickly add a couple of decisions that I think looking back we never should have taken that was a result of BRAC. One was closing the Naval Air Station in Cecil Field, leaving us only with NAS Oceana, which is having enormous encroachment problems and others. And the other was this consolidation of Bethesda and Walter Reed. I don't know of anybody, when you look at the money that's going to be spent on transportation and the road, all that kind of, that 
that was another bad decision. So to think somehow that BRACs are nirvana is, is really not an accurate depiction. And we all know, too, what BRACs are. It's an abrogation, an act of cowardice on the part of Congress because they can't close a single base of their own. But I would never repeat that. <laughs> Go here in the third row. Hi, good morning. Christiana Moore with the Government Accountability Office. Um, our organization, along with our sister organizations, CBO and CBRS, have a whole body of work on defense business operations um, that have come out and basically that the Department of Defense is on an unsustainable path. Can you speak to that, please? I can speak to those studies have been very important to us. They've been very helpful to us in developing the legislation that we have, and we will continue to use them I think all of us, particularly where Mac and I sit, appreciate the GAO, particularly in the work that they do. They, are, they're, they really are the, the watchdogs, and they've become more and more important over the years as, the, as their knowledge and background on many of these issues. We had a very interesting hearing on the carrier, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, and the GAO uh, represented their uh, witness was very important in providing balance in that hearing. But, no. Yeah, and we have used G GAO on the acquisition reform steps we have taken so far and will continue to do so. I just emphasize that a lot of the things y'all focus on, the business sorts of things with the department, have a huge effect on acquisition uh, and, and bu buying uh, goods and services. So that's part of the reason that, that we're committed to take many more steps in order to improve the way that taxpayer dollars are used for those things, and we'll need y'all's help to do it. Here in the fifth row, please. Morning, Jeff Phillips with the Reserve Officers Association. With the linkage of the National Guard and Reserve Equipment Accounts to OCO, what will happen to modernization and equipping of our reserve components, a million men and women strong? Well, it, it depends on what happens with, the, with these bills. Uh, obviously, uh, you cannot buy things if there's not some sort of agreement on the authorizing the purchases and appropriating the dollars to do so. Um, and and you, that's part of the reason you've seen huge, a large number of House members say that just operating for the rest of the fiscal year on a continuing resolution is unacceptable uh, because they're, we're doing some things we don't need to keep doing, and we need to do more of some things that we're not doing now, and CRs do not allow you that flexibility. So uh, there, are, there are needs in all sorts of areas needs to be filled that will not be filled if this bill is vetoed and if there's not some sort of a budget agreement. Yeah, I can't emphasize enough, a continuing resolution for the rest of this year is incredibly damaging to our ability to defend this nation. You know, General Odierno, um, who we have greatest respect for, you know him very well, Mike, has painted a very stark picture of what happens if we don't re if we don't stop sequestration. You don't stop sequestration and have a continuing resolution. I'll tell you, it, it, it is going to be more damaging than any time that I've ever seen. By the way, a clarifying question for me. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Chairman Thornberry, that a lot of the extra $38 billion is in operations and maintenance accounts. But I assume by doing things that way, you allowed yourself a little bit more play in the base budget for procurement. In other words, if we don't get a resolution and we go back to a CR, in addition to having to continue policies of last year, which may be inappropriate, we're also going to be at a lower level of defense acquisition. Is that a fair? Yeah, and, and a lower level of operations and maintenance. Yeah. Essentially, if you look at it, it the, for if sequestration kicks in and you have those across-the-board cuts, that is essentially the same level as a CR. So it, as, as John says, it would be devastating to, uh, to any semblance of, of, of what it takes to defend the country. Please don't underestimate the effect that this has on the men and women who are serving. A lot of the really good ones <coughs> and others are saying, I've had enough. 
they don't they can't operate they can't maintain they can't do the exercises they don't know when their next operation or exercise is talk to some of them these cap young captains and majors <laughs> and senior enlisted uh, they are they are hurting very badly and over time this is going to hurt retention of the really outstanding people we have by the way bob hale who i see in the audience has also noted that we hurt the civil service. We hurt the employ the civilian employees with these kinds of messages as well because they're the ones that also have been furloughed and lost pay or at least temporarily and gotten a message that they weren't valued as much as they should. I think we have time for one last question uh, in the very back row. Hi, my name is Farhad Puladi. I'm with the Voice of America, the Persian service, and my question is directed to Senator McCain. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you talked yesterday about the possibility or recommendation for a no-fly zone on Syria. I was wondering whether uh, to counter the Russian campaign there. Uh, wouldn't that be a counterproductive with the coalition air campaign there? And my second question is that if you are still in contact with the al Ebadi government in Iraq, uh, Prime Minister, uh, have you recommended them to restrict the activities of General Soleimani there and whether they have come back with you with any kind of response to that. Thank you. I've had several conversations with the Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, but frankly, I have not recently, and it doesn't have to me, be me to, to carry the message of what we think of Soleimani. In a hearing before the Armed Services Committee, uh, Senator Cotton asked General Dunford how many Marines and soldiers that he believed were killed by the copper-tipped IEDs that I referred to earlier that the Iranians shipped into Iraq, and General Dunford said he thought 500 uh, were killed. I think it's a little less than that, than that actually. So now we're seeing Mr. Soleimani flip-flop, uh, hopping around at different places, including a visit to Moscow as uh, and orchestrating the activities in Iraq itself. We, we've, we've come a long way. I didn't get the, I couldn't hear the first question. I think it was about Syria, right? And the no-fly zone, is that? Well, even uh, Secretary, uh, former Secretary Clinton, as well as General Petraeus and others have all recommended a no-fly zone, buffer zone for where refugees could locate, uh, stop the barrel bombing, uh, and an area where we could uh, train and equip uh, moderates. Uh, I, as far as I can tell, almost everybody that I know and respect uh, approves of some form of that, except for uh, Susan Rice and Valerie Jarrett and Barack Obama. Well, we've been very privileged to have these gentlemen here today, so please join me in a round of applause for the chairman.